You know what's interesting for me is that uh, what I've tried to Rajiv Jain and he's been on the channel several times in different uh, avatars. He's a he's a very value conscious guy, mm. and unlike a lot of foreign institutional investors who always bought into uh, only IT and banks and consumer stocks in India, his large holdings are SBI, mm. Power Grid, NTPC, ITC. So he typically likes to buy distress. The fact that a large investor is betting on the infrastructure sector, because if you're betting on SBI, Power Grid, and NTPC, it clearly means that you're betting on the infrastructure sector. Yeah. So is Rajiv Jain indirectly saying that, folks, for next couple of years, IT is okay, banks are decent, but the real money for a long-term investor would be made where there is value and where there is a, a, you know, functionality in terms of visibility. I think it's infrastructure. For me, that also yeah. is an important takeaway. What we still not been able to figure out is that why did he buy from the promoters? Why did he not pick up the LIC stake? Yeah. Why did he not buy from the, the open market? Open market? Yeah. Uh, and uh, given that there are compulsions which are at play for most of the global investors, ESG and others, how the how his funds now or how his investors will react to this Adani purchase. Yeah, in fact, let's hear it from the horse's mouth himself, the man of the moment. It's the Mega ED now exclusive and Nikunj caught up with the man of the moment just over the weekend, whose 15,000 crore rupee investment in the Adani group cheered the markets. Rajiv Jain explains his rationale behind his big bet. This short sale report came out, uh, which which obviously uh, was, was very uh, strongly worded in my opinion. Uh, although as we started peeling the onion, we thought that this was kind of, you know, uh, old rehash story. Uh, and, and, the, and from our perspective, the substance was not as, 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 as meaningful here. Um, but but that, that sort of triggered this leg, which, which, which took it down. And I think the other part is that the technicalities of the index players involved, uh, so and so kind of made it worse. Right. Uh, the fact that Adani group of stocks by traditional yardstick are expensive and their debt levels are high. Uh, as a fund manager, as an investor, uh, what gives you the conviction that both the concerns which historically have been big concerns for Adani group of stocks, uh, those uh, concerns uh, according to you in your playbook is something which is manageable? See, if you look at vast majority, uh, vast majority of the assets are regulated assets. They tend to a very, very long tail. So when you have you, you can't have financial leverage along with operating leverage. These companies uh, have very sort of uh, predictable long-term trajectory, even if you slow down the growth. So that's the first part of it. And when you adjust for the leverage, in fact, if you look at the U.S. utilities, and, and, and we own a bunch of them, on an average debt to EBITDA levels in U.S. utilities, and these are some of the best of the breed, is around six to seven times debt to EBITDA. Uh, if you look at the, the leverage here, it's around three, three and a half times. But the growth capex is why the 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 negative free cash flow kicks in. So I think I think uh, they have predictable rev earning stream that 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 has twenty plus year visibility. They, these are regulated assets, and in growth utilities they tend to have negative free cash flow. That's the norm. That's in fact you want to have them you you want to have them have negative free cash flow. That means because they're they're able to deploy capital on a longer term basis with fairly attractive returns. So the the debt levels when you look from a utility perspective is actually. On the lower side, not on the higher side, but if they if they lower the capex plans, which they already announced, I think I think I think it becomes a fairly attractive sort of risk reward. Every investment which you do comes with an underlying risk. So for any group of companies, how would you define your risk? What could go wrong, which you currently are aware of, but that is something which you are you are factoring in? What is the risk according to you? Well, I think the, the, as as you said, there are always some risk in that. I think I think the risk would be if the growth slows down dramatically. Um, uh, in 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 some 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 of the companies that we own because the regulatory issues that they might face on a go forward basis because in regulated businesses the biggest risk always is regulation right uh, that's a that's that's the positive but that's a negative uh, so I, I, we don't see any signs of that yet um, I, I, one of our concerns was you know in terms of sort of managing growth um, because these are complex projects I think I think uh, that by the way is, is is sometimes not well appreciated is that. The barriers to entry in infrastructure anywhere in the world are very high, particularly in India. Execution extremely difficult. Uh, I mean, you might remember that POSCO Iron and Steel tried to acquire land for seven, eight years, couldn't even acquire land, and then they left. So greenfield projects are very, very difficult. And 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 that's what I actually quite like it about this group is they have shown remarkable ability to execute on greenfield projects. Uh, and 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 I feel that they they don't get full credit for that. 
um, in terms of ability to pull that off.